Hello everyone, have a great day and welcome to this course, uh, Econ 146B, Agricultural Economics. This is actually a prerequisite course for you to obtain your bachelor's degree of arts in economics. Hello, once again, my name is Sir Paul and I will be discussing uh, topics pertaining to understanding agricultural economics. We need to discuss the introduction to economics, um, important terms of economics, the scope of agricultural economics, history of agricultural economics, and also the role of agriculture to the Philippine economy. And lastly, we will be tackling the scarce resource. Uh, in order for us to understand the concept of economics or economic application to agriculture, uh, we need to define first the economics. Now, economics is founded on these two concepts. We have scarce resources and unlimited ones. Now, out of these two concepts, we define economics as a study of how limited resources can best use to fulfill unlimited human wants and the human wants and desires of human being are unlimited and that is why we face constraint and limitation and uh, also an entire society or an entire country or for the matter the world faces constraint and limitation in the availability of resources when a word resources is used, people usually think of basic natural resources such as oil and gas and iron ore. However, the term has much broader economic meaning. And economists include not only basic natural resources, but a broad array of other items that would not occur to those who have not studied economics. Now, for example, students may attend to college, same as you, because they hope to obtain skills that will allow them to earn higher income, because that's our first. Uh, most of us want to lift uh, the family status from poverty. That's why we study. Now, as students, we view the lack of college degree to be a constraint or limitation on our ability to earn more income. Now, underlying this is the basic driving force of unlimited human wants. Because human as we are, we want something and we desire something and that's unlimited. Whereas the resources we use in fulfilling these wants and desires are limited. Now, the basic problem that must be faced both by individual and by our societies, how best to go about utilizing our scarce resources. In order for us to, uh, to fulfill our unlimited ones. And also, for, for this, it, studying economics, we are also studying logic of economic theory. Now, economists and others have made numerous attempts to define the word theory. Uh, definition widely accepted by economists is that a theory is representation of a set of relationship or economic theory can be uh, or can represent either the set of relationships governing the behavior of individual producer and consumer or the set of relationships governing the overall economy of the society or of the nation. In conclusion, um, social scientists that a theory does not adequately explain the behavior of a particular group of people and does not render the theory itself invalid. Now, the same theory might be quite applicable to other people under a slight different set of circumstances. And in studying economic as well, we need to understand these important terms we will be using. First, we have choice, allocation, 
scarcity, wants, and needs. Now, when we talk about making right and informed decision, so it means that we need to make a choice. First, this refers to action made by individual being. Now, it's a product of our choice. Now, in making choices, uh, we need to be informed. So we need to learn as much as we could. So that is why it is very imperative that we are learning every day. Now, why we need to make choices? Because we need to allocate our resources. So meaning, uh, we need to put our resources in the best use. So allocation is also synonymous to budgeting. And also, why we need to do this is because we are confronted with scarcity. This refers to a condition wherein most things that we want are available only on limited supply. Now, our wants, this refers to our need or desire as man, which may not be necessary for human or a human body to function normally. It could either be the luxury goods such as computer, cell phone, personal, gadgets, and many more. Uh, when we talk about needs, on the other hand, these are basic necessities uh, for us to survive, for us to function, uh, function normally. These are foods, shelter, clothing, and even vitamin uh, for that regard. So these are important terms that we need to understand in learning economics. Now, economics is a very broad uh, concept. That is why it is divided into two concepts. We have microeconomics and macroeconomics. Now, microeconomics is a branch of economics that deals or focuses of the actions or behavior of individual agents or a group of agents. Now, for example, microeconomists are concerned with the economic behavior of consumers who demand goods and services and producers who supply goods and services and the determination of price of those goods and services. On the other hand, macroeconomics uh, focuses on a broad aggregate such as the growth of the nation's gross domestic product, the gaps between the economy's potential GDP and the current GDP, and trade-offs between unemployment and inflation. For example, macroeconomists are concerned with identifying the monetary and fiscal policy that would reduce inflation, promote growth of the nation's economy, and improve the nation's trade balance with regards to imports minus export and reduce the national debt. Since we already discussed that there are two branches of economics now, we need to know the approaches used in answering problems in economics. Number one, we have positive. Number two, we have normative economics. When we talk about positive economics, this deals with what is and what would happen if approach. And on this approach, it is very objective, meaning there is no value judgment or prescriptions made. Instead, the economic behavior of producer and consumers is explained. For example, policymakers may be interested in knowing how consumers and producers would respond to a tax cut or alternately to a tax hike. Or policymakers may be interested in what degree to the problem of obesity may be mitigated if a notable tax is placed on sugar sweetened beverages. Now, on the other hand, normative economics, this focuses on determining what should be and what ought to be. This approach is very subjective. For example, policymakers might inquire as to which of several alternative policies should be adopted to maximize the economic welfare of producers and consumers. Another example at the micro level, an automobile manufacturing plant might be interested in knowing the number of vehicles it should be produced to maximize profit. And that would be positive and normative economics. 
We also need to discuss the alternative economic system. Now, an economic system can be defined as institutional means by which resources are used to satisfy human desires. Now, the term institutional refers to the laws, habits, ethics, and customs of the nation's citizens. Number one example for alternative economic system is capitalism, wherein it is a free market economy in which individual owns resources and have the right to employ their time and resources However, they need to choose and under minimal legal constraint from the government. In the market as well, price is an indicator. Next is one is under socialism or communism. Resources are generally collectively owned and the government decides how human and human resources are to be utilized across the various sectors of the economy. Now, prices largely are set by the government and administered to the consumers and farmers. Last type of economic system is the mixed economic system. Now, the market are not entirely free to determine the price in some markets, but are free in other markets. For example, is that government intervention in agriculture arena, loans guaranteed to crop producers and guarantees to savings, and loan depositors are form of government intervention. The other one is that the government also control numerous aspects of first transportation, then communication, then education, and finance. So these are the type of economic system. We have the capitalism, we have socialism or communism, and then we have mixed economic system. Now we will be discussing the scope of agricultural economics. Now agriculture is, as we know, an important sector of our economy. Because the mutual dependence of various sectors such as industry and service are dependent on the establishment of agriculture. Now, the growth of one sector is necessary for the growth of other sector as well. So, for example, um, the agriculture produces the raw materials, the industry will go into manufacture, and the service will go into utilize the products and services. Now, if in this case, we already have the picture on where the agricultural economics would come in. Now, the scope of agricultural economics would answer this um, objective, how development of agriculture helps the development of other sectors of the economy. Second is that how labor and capital flow into a non-agricultural sector. The third one is that how agricultural development initiates and sustain the development of other sectors of the economy. In order for us to understand agricultural economics, we need to trace back its history. And it started in ancient Egypt, wherein Joseph interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh and uh, correctly predicted seven years of feast and seven years of famine. Now, technically, it started uh, as an application of principle of economics to the productions of crops and livestock. Now, it's a discipline known as agronomics. Agronomics was a branch of economics that specifically dealt with land usage and it focuses on maximizing the yield of crops and maintaining a good soil system and also many contributors to agricultural economics and two persons are notably because of the establishment of this first is we have henry c taylor was the greatest contributor with the establishment of the department of agricultural economics at Wisconsin and another Salks was among the first to examine the development economics as a problem related directly to agriculture. In the Philippines, however, Bureau of Agriculture Economics was formed on June 22, uh, 1963 under the office of the Secretary of the Agriculture and Natural Resources. So what does an agricultural economist do? Agricultural economies at micro level are concerned with issues related to resource use in production, processing, distribution, and consumption of products in the food and fiber system. Now, production economies examine resource demand for business and their supply response. Macroeconomic level, agricultural economies are interested in how agriculture and agribusiness affect domestic and world economies and how the events taking place in other sectors affect these firms and vice versa. For example, agricultural econ economies must evaluate how changes in monetary policy affect the prices of various foods and commodities. Add, macroeconomies uh, with a research interest may use computer-based model to analyze and direct and indirect effects 
the specific monetary or fiscal policy proposal would have on the farm business sector. Macroeconomists employed by multinational food companies examine foreign trade relationship for food and fiber products. Other addresses issues in the area of international development. Now, the role of agriculture to the Philippine economy is that first, national income, this is for JDP and JNP, next is that for employment, the third one is for industrial development, and the third is for the international trade and economic planning, growth, and development of our country. Now, this is that. We need to talk about the scarce resources. Now, the term scarcity refers to the finite quantity of resources that are available to meet the society's need. And these scarce resources are categorized into three. We have natural and biological resources, human resource, and the manufactured resources. The first category is that natural and biological resource. Biological resources are livestock, wildlife, and different genetic varieties of crops. On the other hand, land and mineral deposits are examples of scarce natural resources. Now, human resources is the second category for the scarce resource, wherein farm laborers are input to produce crops and livestock. Labor is considered scarce even when the country's labor force is not fully employed. Another type of human resource is management. This provides entrepreneurial services, which may entail the formation of a new firm, the renovation or expansion of an existing firm, then taking the financial risk and the supervision of the use of the firm's existing resources that its objective can be met without entrepreneurial ship, large scale agribusinesses would cease to operating efficiently. Category for scarce resource is the manufactured resources, or simply we call it capital. These are machines, equipment, and structures. When we talk about scarce resources, we are confronted with scarcity. It's a relative concept. Nations with high per capita income and wealth face the same problem of scarcity like the nations with low per capita incomes and wealth. The difference lies in the degree to which resource scarcity exists and the forms that it takes 